Welcome to the good, the bad, and the sequel Q&A. My name's Doug. This week's video interview is with stuntman, actor, Jason Voorhees. And he was even a stand-in for John Lithgow. And he did the gun twirling for Jeffrey Jones at Stay Tuned. I'm talking about Canadian's favorite, Ken Kiersinger. Ken was so nice to take the time to let me pick his brain about his career. And I love talking to people that were in Vancouver in that time in the 80s when the when that filming boom happened, when the dollar in America would stretch a lot more in Vancouver. So many places went out there to film. One of the biggest ones that everyone mentions from around that area, 21 Jump Street, you got Wise Guy. All these shows started and all the movies started booming. And Ken, man, he wanted to be a stuntman at that time after reading a book and his career shows for it. We talked about Jason Takes Manhattan, where he talks about how he's almost Jason, but then he was just a stunt coordinator, then Jason's double for second unit shots. And he has so many credits over his career that I love. He was a helicopter pilot. And I mean, on the acting side, helicopter pilot in Ace Ventura 2. He's the one yelling at Ace when he's on the mountain climbing up in the opening sequence. Also, he's in a hot ride. He's the guy that Dan McBride kicks the shit out of. And just so much more. And talking about Freddy vs. Jason, two icons going head to head. Man, so much fun. So throughout the interview, we're going to talk about so many different things, uh, books, things about his career, anything that I mention a link, I'll put it in the episode notes, the description below. So you can check it out there. Also down there, it'll have our website, sequelsonly.com. And also do me a favor, hit the subscribe button. I think there's a bell. So anytime a new episode goes live, whether it be one of our video sequel reviews or one of our amazing, amazing interviews with some epic people in Hollywood, you can be notified. You don't miss out. We don't want you to do that. So without further ado, here is actor, stuntman, gun twirler, Stand in for John Lithgow and so much more. The amazing Ken Kiersinger. Press the button. We are here, man. This is going to be yeah. cool. It's, I, I haven't really talked to anybody that did like stunts per se. And I know you had the acting side too. Yeah. So it'd be cool to hear like that end of the business. I've heard, of, I've talked to people like, like I chatted with Alex Winter. We did like a Death Wish 3 reunion. With right. him, Kirk Taylor, and Tony Spiridakis. And they talked about their stunts that they did, like falling out of a window and rolling down. And I'm sure what you did was a little more intense. But before we get there, I always like finding out about journeys and how people got into this crazy business. So what part of you grew up in Canada? What part was it? Uh, I grew up in Victoria, actually, on uh, Vancouver Island. Um, I don't know if you know where that is, but... Uh, Vancouver Island is just off the west coast, um, and uh, Victoria is the most southern tip, and uh, it was a great place to grow up. Uh, there was absolutely no film industry there or anything no. uh, while I was growing up, but uh, uh, later in life, when I was in my uh, late teen, let me go back, when I was about 10 or 11, I read an article about a very famous stunt guy named uh, Hal Needham. And um, that kind of tweaked my interest in stunt work and, and uh, you know, working in the business and stuff like that. And uh, it was years later, uh, somebody came to Victoria to film uh, Last Desperado, I think it was, a Western. And they had turned one of the old streets in Victoria into a film set. And, you know, I was walking around and, um, I, you know, I was just like, loved it. I, I fell in love with it right then and there. <laughs> And uh, I was uh, going away to university in uh, Vancouver, but um, and I was playing football at uh, UBC. I was going to ask you that because you're a big dude. I'm sure, like yeah. it was hockey or football. Well, I, I played uh, college basketball as well. Oh wow! And, and football, and uh, um, but I blew my knee out playing football, and Ugh. my sister was living in Los Angeles at the time, and uh, actually she lives there now, but they moved to San Francisco at one point. Anyway, went down to visit her with the idea of looking into stunt work. Oh, wow. uh, turns out, yeah, it turns out her next door neighbor was uh, the props guy on uh, an old TV series called Fall Guy, which was all about a stunt. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah. And so he kind of hooked me up with some phone numbers and said, call, call these stunt guys. I know them. And, and uh, I wish I could remember the names now. Anyway, <laughs> I, I called them and they gave me the phone number of some guys that were getting into stunt work and uh, had done some stunt work in Vancouver. And I came back and called. And uh, I think it was like three or four weeks later, maybe I was working on my first uh, movie doing stunts uh, in Alberta for uh, Superman three. Uh, well, yeah, I saw that on there. I was wondering if that was your first credits. So, yeah. so, so when you're like, re- you talked about like reading, walking onto that set in Vancouver, like, was there something that you prepped in your head about stunts? Did you like try to do something on your own to be like, I can take a well, fall like this? Well, I mean, I played, I, you know, when I, I played rough when I was a kid, that's uh, true. I played a lot of sports. Uh, you know, I, I thought, oh, I can take the knocks, you know. Um, yeah. I played college football. And, and uh, so I, I it just the idea, I loved uh, the old TV series Wild Wild West uh, yeah. when I did. And I used to watch it, you know, when it was first out and Robert Conrad. And I loved the fight scenes that he did. And you could tell that it was him doing a lot of the fighting, if not most of the fighting. And, um, and I just thought, man, this guy moves so good, and it was so cool. And you know, I'd, I'd play fight with my, you know, friends, and we'd stage fight, and you know, play superheroes and all that kind of stuff. And uh, but when I read that article about Hal Needham, and, and um, I, I realized actually over the years that so a lot of people that got into stunt work, something they so they walked on a film set when they were a kid, and it just you know they fell in love with it, and. Uh, you know, around that age, 10 to 12 to 13, you know, something clicked in them and, and they took that idea of being a, a stuntman away in the back of their head <laughs> and, uh, and they became stunt people. Yeah, I think yeah. people have that brush with uh, with the industry, like a lot of people I've talked to, because you have to, to like want to do it because it is a grueling industry, like every side of it, there's oh. the politics of it and everything, but the more positive part you're talking about, like playing superheroes and you know, with your buddies growing up and play fights. So Superman three, a yeah. Canon, a Canon film was your yeah. first one. Yeah. Um, I think it was Paul, Paul Weston, I think was the British stunt coordinator on it. And, uh, it's just funny enough. I ran into him oh, about two years ago and it was very cool to see him and, and yeah. uh, thanked, him, thanked him for a great start and stuff. And, uh, yeah, it was just, you know, there wasn't a lot of industry in Vancouver at the time. There was more in Alberta and, uh, they, they needed some ND stunt guys. And, and, uh, uh, I knew uh, Jacob Rupp, who was one of the first stunt guys in Vancouver. And, uh, he was one of the first, he was the first stunt guy I met. And he goes, Hey, I'm going up to work on uh, Superman three. They need more guys. You want me to put your name in there? And, and, uh, and he did. And, and uh, we ended up going out and working on that together and met some other uh, Canadian stunt guys through that. And, uh, you know, was blown away by the paychecks and, and yeah. uh, you know, it was good money for a kid. I was in, still in university at the time. Oh, you and, still were. Wow. Okay. Oh yeah. No, I was still, I started working in the film business while I was still in university. Wow. Uh, yeah, I was going away to work on movies and coming back and have to catch up on my, you know, my classes and my <laughs> reports and all that kind of stuff. Um, but, you know, I just it's it's something that grabs people. I, I think, you know, you grow up watching TV and you don't realize, you know, it's a real world. I mean, there's people that put this stuff together and then that thing happens where you read that article or you walk on that film set and you go, I could be a part of this. Yeah. And, 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 you know, and you've grown up loving it. And um and that's certainly what happened to me. I know that's the same for a lot of other uh, stunt people. And, and yeah, and actors. just what goes into it. I don't think people realize that until they maybe listen to an interview with someone like really anybody, and they go, "Well, this shot took so and so days, like four days to shoot." And the one that I think about all the time, whenever I talk to anybody about how in depth shots are, is one that you worked on was X Men X Two. I interviewed. Yeah the actor who played the president, he's, his name slipped my mind right now, yeah. but he was telling me how long, how many days that took that he was like under that desk and night crawler was doing all those stunts. Were you the stunt coordinator on that one? No, no, I wasn't the stunt coordinator. I was just one of the stunt guys in the, in the, in the uh, oval office scene. And you oh, okay. see, 
and there was a lot of other stunt guys in that sequence. But what was tough about that sequence was, you know, they have to shoot everything and then and imagine while you're shooting the visual effects that you're putting into it. So, you know, uh, the, 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 you know, the bad guy's doing this. And, the, and so the, and then setting up the next guy, he's got to be here. And it's like a chess game to figure all that out. And um, so, it, so it takes a long time, you know, and, and back then they, it was a little bit harder because the process was a little longer and, and stuff. But um, uh, you mentioned uh, Ace Ventura, uh, Pet yeah. Detective 2 which was one of the movies I worked on. And in the opening sequence, I play the helicopter pilot. I mean, that, that's, I don't know how many couple of minutes on film kind of thing, but uh, yeah. you know, I was, I was there for over a week, you know, wow. shooting that sequence. And uh, I remember uh, we were doing this big long shot where we had two helicopters, you know, I'm in one and it got the camera helicopter following us in on this big opening wide shot opens the movie and you come up to uh, Ace Ventura on the side of the mountain. And uh, um, that was a stunt guy, his stunt double. And I can't remember his name right now either. But, I mean, he was up on the side of that, hanging off this, the side of this mountain way the fuck up there. And yeah. getting bit by, by black flies and stuff like that <laughs> for hours, for hours. And, uh, you know, we're doing this big, long sequence. And, of course, you know, we got dialogue. And, and, and the way they did with that was... Uh, uh, um, he wasn't there. Our, our lead actor wasn't there. They were shooting down in Carolina or something with him. Yeah. With Jim Carrey and uh, uh, morphed his face. They put his face on this when he when the stunt guy turns. They put Jim Carrey's face on him. Then they cut to the helicopter and then they cut yeah. to Jim Carrey on the side of a, a set piece down in down in Carolina. But the stunt guy was up there for hours, Jesus. you know, on this tiny little ledge. And, uh, you know, I think he, he finally got just pissed off enough because this is the last take. <laughs> and uh, I felt so sorry for him. I mean, it was beautiful probably for the first five minutes being up on the side of that mountain and everything. <laughs> when the black flies start biting you, you got no place to go. We're back. Uh, I was looking at your, like, your acting credits because you have a ton of acting. And now that you brought that one up, it's yeah. that one and, like, ones that me and my friends always, like, quote it. Like that whole scene when he's like, if I were you and you were me, I would use your body to get to the top like that. <laughs> and in Hot Rod, the scene in Hot Rod, when yeah. you're the trailer guy and Danny McBride you know, takes you to town. Yeah. <laughs> I, and you know what? I had no idea who Danny McBride was at that point. Not a lot and of people did. That was like only his second or third movie and like not even yeah. a big, you know, major studio movie yet. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so now now I'm honored that he uh, that he kicked me in the nuts, and, <laughs> <laughs> and it's oh, funny, man. you know, I, you do a movie, you don't know how big it's going to be, you know. That I was in for one day on that movie, and uh, but a lot of people, you know, saw it and loved it and, and uh, mentioned it to me, and, and uh, so it was pretty cool. It is funny the things you get mentioned for. I'm sure, like a lot of actors, a lot of people that work in hollywood they do a movie and they're like this is what i'm going to be known for and then it's the movie that they didn't that maybe they did a day on or yeah. a, 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 you know a movie that they didn't really like but it's what the public is going to remember you for for the most part you know yeah yeah i mean look, so, at, look at road road warrior right <laughs> uh, the original road warrior i mean it was a, a cheap little you know australian movie and Look who became famous from it, you know. I know. Yeah. (laughs) So then from Superman 3, you're still in university. What was like that next step? Was it being on that set and like connecting with all the other Canadian stuntmen and then going from there? Yeah. You know, I was actually fortunate because being still in university, I had access to the gyms and the equipment and like nobody had a video camera back then. I mean, uh, uh, so I set up you know, training sessions for uh, myself and, and the other stunt guys. And we would come in into the uh, gymnastics gym and, and uh, you know, practice on the trampoline, get air sense. Uh, you know, we had, there were mats there to practice taking gunshots and doing fight scenes, learning how to do hip tosses and all that kind of stuff. And, and a video camera to so you could come and look at your work. Yeah. And, uh, so, you know, I, I had something to add to the, to the, to the pot. And, um, uh, yeah, those were fun times, uh, uh, because, uh, you know, there were only a couple of guys that have been around, you know, and done 
stunts on movies. And so I learned from them and, and I fortunately got to work with a lot of American stuntmen when they would come to Canada to film and uh, kind of apprenticed underneath them. And, uh, you know, th- those were, those were fun early, <laughs> early years. <laughs> well, that changed pretty quick, right? 83. That was in Canada, but then the yeah. boom happened like pretty soon after that, right? That people were like, Hey, we could shoot in Canada and save some money. And then that was probably yeah. big for. Yeah. Uh, Jump street came along and yeah. Steve Canal uh, brought up, a, you know, hat squad, wise guy, all of a sudden, all those wise guy. Yeah. Were, and I, all of a sudden I was working all the time and, uh, it, you know, just t- it timed out with me getting out of university and, and, uh, um, I walked into this great career where uh, there weren't a lot of stunt guys in town. So if they wanted a big bad guy, you know, I got to play the big bad guy. And yeah. uh, you know, uh, the the community grew fairly quickly, and uh, you know, after that. But uh, you know, it took a while because you couldn't just put anybody on set and uh, uh, you know and make you look bad. You, if you were going to yeah. recommend somebody, you had to know that they could do what you wanted them to do. Um, and a lot of the things were specialties, you know, came along, you know, um, you know, Asian martial arts was, uh, you know, becoming big then uh, yeah. for the TV series and stuff like that. So, you know, some great Asian stunt guys uh, came along uh, here in Vancouver. Dean Cho was one of the first. Um, and so it was fun to kind of grow with the industry and because a lot of other people came along, too. You know, you got to work with the, the new props guy that got in the business and, and yeah. uh, you grew up with these people. Right. Yeah, that's cool. That sense of community. What were you going to school for? Uh, I was majoring in phys ed with a minor in English. You know, I I think I probably, if I hadn't got into stunt work, I probably would have been a cop or a fireman. Uh, Yeah. I don't think I would have been a teacher. (laughs) And then, so like you mentioned, like there was a huge boom. There's like a ton of like shows and movies that you're stunting in at that point. And then the first, was it the first time you were a stunt coordinator was it looks like a cbs summer no sirens it looked like that was like one of the early times you were in charge of the stunts yeah i'm sure it, it depends one, that was one of my, it wasn't my first it was one of the first though yeah it was a pilot uh, pilot for a tv series that that camel was doing and uh I, I, it never went uh sirens yeah but that's cool and you know it's funny like seeing this you know that's such an important job being a stunt coordinator because you're the one that's in charge of everybody, but it's so cool. at such a young age at the age of like 21, 22, you were the one organizing, like doing the workouts in the gym and having the equipment. So that like, you're like was, meant to was, do that. I was going home man. I wanted, I wanted this to be a career. And I knew that, um, uh, you know, that the stunt community was going to grow, that, that the film industry was going to grow. I mean, uh, Back then, I think the dollar was at 75 cents, you know, U.S. And I just thought to myself, how can they afford not to come here? Yeah. If they're going to save, you know, 25% on their budgets. And, you know, the, the, the industry runs on money, right? It, 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 the time is money. And anyway, uh, the industry grew just the way I thought it would. And I got in right at the basement and uh, and grew with it. And, and it was, like I say, those were fun times. We were all kind of... You know the, the the props guy, the effects guys. I mean, we had a really great effects guy in Vancouver, uh, John Thomas, who had started out as a stuntman but got into special effects. And and uh, John had a real affinity with the stunt community, and um, uh, since passed away. But uh, uh, there's a special effects studio named after him here. Yeah, oh, that's cool. You know, these these were people that kind of helped you along, and and. Uh, um, you know, I remember doing a car chase that I almost got killed on, and you know, I came back to work and, and uh, you know, I fractured my elbow and stuff like that. And he, he knew I was getting on the horse, uh, again. And, and uh, so he was there, he was anything I can do for it. Oh, I'm a little afraid of you know, afraid of my bumper overlapping on the, on the other car. And he brought in a guy and he welded a new section on you know, a section of a bumper there. I mean, he, you know, he was just such a fantastic guy. and it was like that through the whole community. We were all helping each other. It was uh, a, a great time. There was a great sense of camaraderie. That's great, man. Yeah. So, so like around that time, you had all these series and movies you're doing, like cool movies like Who's Harry Crumb, Speed Zone. 
And then just one of my favorite movies, like being a Jersey guy, Friday the 13th, even though they only filmed the one here and then the rest of them were all over. (laughs) And then probably the same thing. They noticed the, how much they can save on the dollar. And so they made uh, Vancouver look like the coast of New Jersey. And then, so how did that happen? How did you land the gig for Jason takes Manhattan? Uh, I had worked with uh, Randy Sheveldade, who was the production manager on the show. And uh, he actually called me up and he said the first message on my machine from him was, uh, uh, because we had machines back then, (laughs) um, was, hey, Ken, do you want to be the stunt coordinator on this Friday the 13th movie and play Jason? And uh, I... By the time I got back to him, I was working on something else at the time. Uh, the, I got another message from him saying, um, "Oh, listen, we, you know, the guy that played him before has made a deal, and so we oh. just need to be stunt coordinator." And, and uh, so I came on as the stunt coordinator and the stunt double and the fry cook, and and uh, you know, on the, and worked on that project. I love the fry cook. I think that's the coolest thing. Like when we covered it, yeah, I was like, you know, well, I've seen the movie a million times because. It was just one of those ones that was always on USA and, uh, and, uh, man. And I remember seeing that fact that it was like the fry cook went on to play, you know, Jason and Freddy versus Jason. I think the coolest thing is, is I don't even know if you were aware of it at the time that Rob Hedden, like the writer, is this is something way before production started that he wanted that movie to be Freddy versus Jason. Oh, I had no idea about that. No. Yeah. I don't no. know if you were you in the documentary at all. Did they reach out to you to do like the behind the scenes? Like the I don't know. It was like a while ago they did it. But in it, he talks about that. But New Line, Freddie, they wanted so much money because their fourth movie of the year before did so well. Yeah. The Dream Master. So they wanted like more of a cut like boxing. You know, you have two heavyweights or like Freddie, Freddie and Jason. So they just like nix the idea, but man, that is uh, that's such a cool yeah, movie. No, it's... I had no idea. That seems really early for that <laughs> idea, but I mean, uh, it only makes sense, right? Because you look at the past, you know, Frankenstein, Dracula, the werewolf. Yeah. Um, you know, they put, ended up putting all those characters together, and um, so it was kind of inevitable that eventually they would do it with some of the other horror, you know, iconic horror uh, monsters. Yeah, and then they wanted to, Rob wanted the script, again, this is probably nixed on a script before you even got it, but he wanted to have, like, it be so in New York, like, the kills, like, he wanted, like, one of the girls to die at, like, Madison Square Garden, somebody else die in front of, like, the Statue of Liberty, then obviously, for budgetary purposes, they only had, like, those few minutes in Times Square, but, so I interviewed a couple people that were the victims in that, one was uh, Tiffany Paulson, who is Susie Donaldson who gets killed on the boat. Right. In that yep. scene. And uh, she told me that her original death was supposed to be like some intricate, like underwater, like he shoots her underwater, but something happened. Uh, I, I don't know. I mean, what I, what, what's what I, what you see on the screen is, was the script that I got. Yeah, I'm sure. So, uh, she may have had access to earlier scripts that they had yeah. to write for, again for budgetary reasons. Um, but uh, yeah, we had uh, you know we had water a lot of water sequences in that and and uh, and some some good kills. There were some good kills in there. Do you have any favorite that you were able to like put your like flavor on? Uh, well, my favorite kills in Freddy versus Jason: the bed folding. Yeah. You yeah, know, because it's so not expected. Um, yeah. You know, you expect Jason to you know steer the guy with the uh, with the machete, but to pull the bed up, I just thought was brilliant. Uh, you know, I gotta say, Ronnie Yu was uh, such a great choice for director for Freddy vs. Jason because yeah. he, um, uh, he 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 has a martial arts background, and uh, you know, um, a lot of people said, "Well, how's Freddy going to fight Jason?" You know, Jason's just so much bigger. And anybody who's done martial arts knows that, you know, size isn't, you know, it doesn't determine who wins the fight. Yeah. And uh, Ronnie just put a great touch on that. And, and uh, um, you know, I think if it, if he hadn't been a director from, from Hong Kong, uh, Freddie versus Jason would have been so, so much different. Uh, but he put a really great spin on it. Yeah. The movie has great colors and I think it does the right thing. It, it, it like, 
gives the audience what they love about each. Like yeah. throughout the movie, it's like they didn't have to reinvent everything. Just go to the well of everything that everybody loves of both. And it was a clever story that like Freddie needed to use yeah. yourself, Jason, in order to put the fear in everyone. <laughs> so that was pretty well, I, neat. I think it was the 10th, you know, or so script that they had considered. And so they yeah. well, put a lot of thought into it. And, and, um, uh, you know, the thing about Freddy vs. Jason is you didn't have to see all the other movies of both franchises to enjoy the movie. Yeah. And a lot of, a lot of people that I've spoken to, you know, hadn't seen all the, all the movies from all the franchises. And, uh, you know, Freddy vs. Jason turned them on to both franchises. You know, it's like, oh, this is cool. You know, now I'm going to watch the Elm Streets. Now I'm going to watch the, the Friday the 13th. Um, so, it, you know, they just did a great job of... of, of putting a script together that and it had the tidbits for the people that, you know, had seen all the franchises and yeah. stuff like that. So. No, you're right. No, that's so true. And one thing I love about that, we can, we'll go back to like other things just sure, about yeah. your career. But one thing I, I think is still the funniest thing about it wasn't even the movie was the weigh in the Vegas style weigh in yeah. <laughs> is like the funniest thing. That was, it wasn't that a great marketing idea. I love it. Uh, you know, it was just a really great idea. Um, we had a full auditorium for that. And, uh, you know, I didn't really know when, when I got the job, how big a deal it was. And, uh, it was even bigger because it was both franchises. Yeah. Uh, so, um, when we did the Vegas thing, it was just like blew me away a bit. And, and uh, you know, I really, I really, enjoyed, Robert, ate it up i mean he you know, put him on stage and makeup and he's he just let him go so i you know i didn't have that much to do except you know do my jason walk yeah um, but uh, but uh, you know it was just a great idea to get the guy you know let's get ready to rumble <laughs> yeah you know just set it up perfectly and everything so that was just a great marketing idea yeah oh, so great robert's great and just he loves it like he embodied that character other people shy away from a character that they played and like that's who they are sometimes so how did that role come about did you get was it like an open audition or somebody said hey ken remember 15 years ago when you were that i asked you to be him no it was uh, uh i was actually being interviewed for the stunt coordinating job oh, wow. uh, so i go in to meet with the uh, uh with the uh producer the line producer doug uh, blanking on the name but uh so i'm sitting down across from him and, and, and he's looking at me and and uh i can tell his mind's kind of someplace else and, and uh then fi finally he just says you know would you be interested in playing jason wow and uh and i, I said yeah sure um and he goes well you, you know you'd have to audition but uh um you're 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 the right height and right build you know what we've been looking for and they've been auditioning a lot of different people for it um, but you know, would you audition for it? And I said, yeah, sure. So they set me up for the audition and the audition was, uh, wearing a really cheap Jason mask. And, uh, they read the opening scene of the girl swimming in the lake and they did a close up of my eyes reacting to her in the lake and the dialogue and all that kind of stuff. And then they had me walk around the room and, uh, they sent that to Ronnie Yu. And then I went in, uh, I got a call back to go meet with Ronnie and, and, uh, and Ronnie, you know, basically okayed me in the room. Wow. And, uh, I, you know, it, part of it was, you know, I hit, I had worn the Jason costume before in, in uh, n number eight and uh, had experience with the franchise. Um, they knew that they wanted to cast a stunt guy, even though uh, they made it very clear to me from the get-go that I would have a stunt double. Really? Um, well, it was just such a big budget movie. Oh, so, yeah, insurance yeah. purpose, yeah. So, uh, for insurance and also they they run a main and a second unit um and they always tend to shoot the action on second unit oh yeah and then pick up shots on, on main unit with the main actors and stuff like that and uh, because I, I specifically asked i said you know uh, there's one stunt i really want to do because i knew it would get nominated for a world stuntman's award and, and it was the fire gag in the cornfield uh, so I specifically asked to do to do that, and uh, he said, "No, Ken, we're hiring you as an actor on this movie, and, and uh, <laughs> that's going to be shot on second unit. We'll have you on main unit." And so the last night of filming, though, um, you know, I did the fight stuff, you know, at, at the camp and whatnot. So it's not like I didn't do any stunt work on the thing. 
So yeah. the last night of filming, uh, Glenn Ennis, who was doubling me, um, had the costume on that was right for the hand coming out of the grave, I think. And, and, uh, and, and, and uh, I had the right costume on for when Jason gets thrown out of the van that's flipping down the road. So uh, they came to me and they go, you know, last night of filming, you know, uh, Ken, you're in the right, do you, do you mind doing the ratchet out of the back of the van? And, and I said, oh, now, now I'm expendable. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, right. so I ended up doing that. Uh, but, uh, yeah, um, it was just, uh, sorry, this is Max. Hey, uh, Max. Hey, Max, <laughs> what do we know? Um, but man, that's so wild. I think the, like the connection of it, the 15 years late, like four, uh, 13, 14 years later. So what about, so was it the same thing when Kane was in the costume? Did they let him do any of that? Or were you a body double uh, like Glenn was for you? Yes, uh, that's to say, they didn't have as much second unit to shoot on number yeah. eight, but they had second unit to shoot. So I did the second unit stuff, um, and uh, still so, like the car hit the the uh, getting electric climbing into the boat. Uh, Is that you? No, I, don't think I did that one. Uh, uh, I did the getting electrocuted on the you know uh, walking down off the train, getting electrocuted. Oh yeah. On the box. Um, Oh, when his face melts, that's a that's a, a prosthetic face, and those were my hands and stuff. Oh. Uh, one or two other things, yeah. I always loved the Julius kill. That's like, even though the head and the way it flies off and everything, I think that is yeah. so cool. Like, because that's like the only time in the series really that you see him be like damaged by like a human, like just the right. way Julius is giving him shots to the gut. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that was a great scene. I, I had a, a friend of mine, uh, Ernie Jackson, doubling him, and uh, you know, did some did some of it. But, uh, the actor did most of his own, threw most most of his own punches, and, and uh, the idea of uh, the head coming right off. I mean, you know, it's so it's kind of, it's it's so over the top kind of thing, yeah. right? You know, it's like if you hit somebody that hard, you might take their jaw off, you know, but the head's <laughs> going to stay on. And so that but the head coming off, you know, <laughs> suspend all reality when it comes to slasher films. Oh yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then from there, so so while you're doing the stunt work, like we'll go back to you know, like ninety ish, like that part of it. So you're doing the the stunt and the acting. Was it just mostly up in Vancouver, or were you already like in it? Did you ever come down to LA for a while? Uh, no, I uh, there was no reason to go to LA for me. Wow, and, and, you know, I was actually bouncing between Toronto and Vancouver. Um, so early in my career, I would, you know, one week, uh, you know, I'd spend a week or two in Toronto doing working on a film or a TV series or something like that. Then I'd fly back to Vancouver, get a day in, get another phone call. Hey, can you come back out to Toronto? Wow, you know, I was going back and forth between Vancouver and Toronto a lot. Um, and then Vancouver just got so steady and busy and, and, uh, they ended up, you know, they found another big guy in Toronto that, that, uh, they could use. And, and, uh, so I ended up, you know, spending most of my time in, in Vancouver. I did go down to Arizona to do a, uh, a, a Western sequence for a movie called Stay Tuned. Um, oh, yeah. uh, I was doubling, an, doubling an actor doing, uh, his fast draw and, and uh, so I do. I, I did gun spinning and fast draw. And, Wait, were you um, were you John Ritter or were you Jeffrey Jones? Jeffrey Jones. I doubled Jeffrey Jones for his <laughs> fast draw. Nice. That's and, awesome. and I had, I was doubling him when he when they were shooting in Vancouver. Uh, so I had been doubling him in Vancouver, and uh, the American stunt coordinator, I think it was Gary Combs. Um, uh, I let him know. I I, I, I hey I do Western fast draw and. And gun spinning and he goes well send me a tape so i did a tape of me spinning guns and stuff like that he goes you're hired so we we go down there and we're shooting in old tucson with this old western town and they have the live shows there and everything right so they got cowboys there that do western you know fast draw and gun spinning and yeah and they do the live show you know the gun fights and stuff and, and they found out that i was there to just to do jeffrey jones's uh, fast draw uh, there was a spin, you know, a spin out of the holster, shoot, spin back into the holster. And uh, I had these guys all lined up watching me, you know, uh, you know, to see how I did kind of thing. And, uh, luckily, I, the first time I did it, I, I did it so fast the camera missed it. 
and, and just sort of looked up at the director and he goes, wow, you slow it down a bit. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> But anyway, I was lucky I pulled that out. Yeah, actually, I got to do uh, James Arness's Fast Draw in the first TV movie of uh, called Gunsmoke Return to Dodge. Wow. Now, a lot of people might not remember Gunsmoke, the old TV yeah. series. It was one of the longest TV series in the world, but I grew up watching that. And uh, uh, there's a scene at the end where he has the gunfight with the bad guy, and I got to do James Arness's Fast Draw for that. So. Wow, that's, that's surreal. You know, one, one of the little, you know, great things is tucked away yeah. in my memory. Chain. Yeah. How did how did you get to start doing that? Was it something you did as a kid, like guns, or was you like, oh, this is something I should learn? You know, it's a funny thing. You, you know, you, uh, I, you know, I'm Canadian. A lot of people don't think of Canadians and guns, but when I was a kid, I would go to the Sears catalog, and I was always, you know, every Christmas I wanted a, a new a new toy gun. Yeah, and so I grew up sort of enamored of westerns and and guns and stuff like that, and uh, I think it was after like my first knee injury and I was laid up, I uh, uh, bought a replica handgun and a and a holster, and because I was I couldn't walk around too much, and I started spinning a gun, and um, I just practiced and practiced and and learned from you know watching. Uh, you know, Clint Eastwood, you know, when he's handing the guy the gun, he spins it around and shoots him. And um, uh, for Outlaw Josie Wales and, and uh, watching Sammy Davis Jr. and, and uh, Kirk Douglas, they, you know, both had great scenes where they spun guns and stuff. And I just thought, oh, this, you know, might be handy one day. And, yeah. uh, and I was always enamored of it. So, so I learned. Yeah, myself. and it paid off. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so when it comes to, this is like a more of a general question about being a stunt coordinator. Like when you're planning a stunt, what is that process? Are you going in and doing it or like, how does that work? Well, it starts up, you read the script and you break the script down, all the stunts that are involved in that script. And then you have a meeting with the uh, director at some point to discuss, you know, his vision of that stunt and, you know, uh, uh, and then you break it down from there. Uh, you know, you, you talk to him about how he, you know, how he sees it and you set it up accordingly, uh, right down to, you know, how many stunt guys you're going to use, uh, um, the equipment you're going to use, you know, planning the rehearsal days so that once the set's built, you got to make sure you have enough time to get on there and, and set up the ratchet so that you can haul the guy across the room into the furniture and yeah. uh, so you got to know where the furniture is going to be. And, and uh, you know, the director tells you where he's going to be putting the cameras. And and, uh, and so, it, it you know, you break it down into its pieces. It, it can all be a little overwhelming. But you, once you break it into its pieces, uh, then then you set it up, budget it, you know, rehearsal equipment, uh, stunt stunt people. And, and you just do it a step at a time. Wow. No, yeah, because it like obviously things can always go wrong with things. So I always wondered like how involved, like, cause you hear some of these like horror stories about like what have happened on sets. So now that's cool that it's, it's really a long process, like sitting with the director, figuring everything out. Well, uh, when you're doing uh, films, you have more time, uh, for yeah. feature films, you tend to get more time and stuff. But when I was doing like the X-Files and a TV series, I mean, uh, these days on some TV series, you've got two stunt coordinators. You've got one doing one episode and then you've got another doing the next episode to give them time to set up and everything. And they have more money to do, to do it. But, uh, you know, stunt coordinators will have assistance or something like that. When I was doing X-Files, I was doing it all by myself. And so, yeah. I, you know, while we're shooting one episode, I'm prepping for the next and, you know, running around <laughs> trying to get all that done. And there's a lot of responsibility for the safety of not just the stunt people, but the, the crew members as well. Um, you know, should something goes wrong, uh, go wrong, you, you want to make sure the camera's not, and the people behind the camera aren't in a dangerous yeah. place. And, and uh, so there, there was a lot to do that it, it could get quite busy. <laughs> I think it, it just comes with the territory, like broken bones. Like you said, you, you hurt your knee. Like how many bones have you broken over your career? Well, I mean, I have to start at my toes and work my way up to <laughs> remember them all. And some, some are doubled up. So, um, <laughs> You know, the injury rate in stunt work is 100%. Just like playing, if you play pro football, you're going to get hurt. 
if you oh, play yeah. a pro sport, you know, the odds are eventually you're going to get hurt. And uh, you just hope that as, as a stunt performer, it's not a career ending one. Or, yeah. Or something really devastating. And, and unfortunately, uh, you know, we, there have been fatalities and um, uh, some serious injuries, you know, career ending injuries where that people have survived. But, um, uh, you know, broken bones start, certainly happen and, you know, sprains and, and bruises are just part of the, you know, part of the day's work at the office. And uh, it, 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 you can take some pretty hard thumps uh, doing stunt work. And yeah. these days, you know, I'm, in a, I'm amazed when you look at these big budget, uh, you know, X-Men movies or, or, or the Marvel, Marvel comics, they've got a stunt guy getting ratcheted, you know, and taking a hard hit in the background that nobody even notices, you yeah. know, uh, and you've got maybe eight or 10 guys doing that. Um, and, and ratchets are so prominent today. Um, they weren't, there wasn't as many of them, you know, uh, when I was a young stunt guy coming up. Um, but it, it, those take their toll. I mean, you know, you're hauling people into solid pieces of set piece, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, on the side of a car and, and uh, you know, those are all hard hits those people are taking and, and and they they don't get the recognition for it uh, that, that that they should. I mean, there still isn't an Academy Award for for stunt performance. I know it's just so ridiculous when you have uh, all these scenes in movies that you watch and you're like, oh my god, that looks so real. Like when you're watching yeah, a movie uh, and you say that looks so real, like there yeah. should be a category for that. Yeah, they have the World Stuntman's Awards, um, which is great. You know. Uh, uh, the Taurus, uh, by I think Red Bull still sponsored them, um, and uh, it's great that they've got that. I went to the very first one, and uh, you know it was very cool uh, uh, that they finally were rec- recognizing uh, stunt performers and stuff. And, yeah, and, uh, you say, you know, I, I was hoping to get you know if I could have done the burns for uh, Freddy versus Jason, the burns that uh, that that, that uh, were done in that movie uh, by Glenn. Uh, should have won the World Stuntman's Awards that year. Um, what did one was uh, Last Samurai, and there's a big sequence where a bunch of guys are on fire in Last Samurai. But uh, what really happened was they had small burns on on the stunt guys, and then uh, they CG'd a lot of the fire. Uh. So as far as danger and skill and all that stuff goes, um, you know, I think Glenn did eight burns for that uh, sequence in the cornfield, and uh, uh, it should have won. So it's yeah. all politics, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have you done that before? Fire or is that yeah, like with that? Yeah, yeah. Oh, you have okay. Oh, sure. I mean, that's part of it. When I when I grew up in the business, you wanted to be able to do as much as possible. Uh, yeah. um, you know, every kind of stunt uh, because you work more. Yeah. And stunt guys back then uh, were when you when I brought my stunt bag to work, I I had stuff in there to do fire gags. I had stuff in wow. there to do. Car hits, I had stuff in there to do, you know, a variety, you know, of, of car driving. Um, you know, that was my bag. I, cause I, I thought there were times when you came to set and they said, oh, you know, we'll have you do this stunt too. Or we're shooting on this lot. And because back, I, I remember working on two and I think I, I worked on three shows in one day um, where I was running from set to set to set, you know, working and uh, doing, doing a different stunt. And sometimes I wouldn't know what I was doing until I got there. You know, it, it was just so busy. Wow. <laughs> but that was the fun of it too, right? I, I remember. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, my stunt bag was huge. I mean, you could, you know, a, 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 you know, it, basically the size of a person. And I would sit that in, my, in the bucket seat of my, my Corvette and, and drive to work on a sunny day with the top <laughs> down, thinking I was the luckiest, you know, guy in the world, you know, going and uh, working on a movie. Yeah, it just shows like how young the industry was up there that there probably just wasn't obviously you were great at what you did, you're a big dude. But also it was probably like, man, we need the you know, there's not a ton of people like Ken. You know that can do this. So 3 in 1 day, man, that's crazy. Yeah. Yeah, no, those are like I say, those are great times. Uh, yeah. uh um the industry was young and everybody in it was young and and uh we all uh, the, the the camaraderie was really good because we all wanted the industry to succeed, you yeah. know, NBC and and um, you know so it was important to us that we put out a good product and and that the producers got their money's worth and and uh, uh, so it was like I say it was great times to to be part of the industry here, and it's thriving still. 
Yeah, oh, yeah. Hallmark, that's their capital. And other movies are shot up there, but I know Hallmark, that's all their movies are in Vancouver. I know some actors that I've interviewed that like moved to Vancouver just to just to be in that scene. Well, what's funny is uh, if you're uh, from Vancouver as an actor, you pretty much have to move down to L.A. to get cast in one of the lead roles to come back to Vancouver and work. <laughs> um, I mean, you know, Ryan Reynolds did that. Uh, uh, so many of them uh, do. And yeah. um, uh, so it's just the part of the business, you know, the, the, <laughs> they cast you know, many of the shows that come here out of L.A. first and then uh, and then look to Vancouver. So, Ken, how did the acting come about? Was it just something you wanted to do or you showed up one day? They're like, hey, can you read this line? Yeah. No, I remember I think it was the first uh, acting job, I the first line I had. Uh, so I was playing a big thug, and um, they I came to set, and they, 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 hey, you got some sides. We put your sides in your room. And sides, I don't, oh, yeah, no, you got some lines here. <laughs> <laughs> it was like you know something small like sure boss or something like that and i remember how nervous i was having lines you know as a stunt guy you, you're used to doing that you're very relaxed about it and everything and, and uh but they're you know it's, you've got your shot now it's like you're shot yeah, i'm shot okay now we're shooting you for your lines kind of thing and i remember how, how nervous i was for that but that kept happening you know i kept getting uh small roles and stuff like that and, and uh actually i played Besides doing James Ernest's Fast Draw in Gunsmoke Return to Dodge, I, I played one of the bad guys um, called Potts and uh, worked with an old stunt guy named Tony Epper out of, out of L.A. who belongs to this huge uh, uh, family of stunt people um, that's very famous down there. And, and uh, you know, he, he, he was a big guy. And, and uh, fortunately, he kind of look, looked at me as, you know, here's a young up-and-comer. I think I reminded him a bit of his son, uh, yeah. Daniel. And uh, he and I got along great, and he was a really good actor. And uh, so he gave me some tips, you know, when, when I was when I was uh, working on that, and, and uh, uh, I enjoyed it. You know, it was another challenge. Uh, and and uh, you know, as you get older and your body gets more banged up, it, it, uh, you don't mind doing more lines and more hitting the ground. <laughs> yeah, and you did a lot, so it like took off. Obviously, you were learning. Did you ever take any acting classes along the way? Oh, yeah. 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 Oh, and cool. uh, fortunately, I had a chance to work with a lot of actors, you know, who became friends and, and uh, um, sort of gave you tips as, as you went along kind of thing. And, you, you know, you learn by, by watching and uh, you just, you know, it, it's really a matter of getting relaxed with it. The same thing with stunt work. You know, you've got you've got a big fight to do, a big fight scene to do. And uh, you've memorized all these moves and everything. If you're nervous, you know, all of a sudden you start forgetting stuff. And uh, so I, I see that in young stunt people, you know, fantastic martial artists or whatever, but you put a camera on them, put them on set, and they've got this big long fight scene to do. And, and uh, you know, the nerves get to them kind of thing. And, and so much of being a good actor is just being relaxed and allowing yourself to fall into that character. And uh, I remember I got to work with uh, James Garner uh, early in my nice. career. And I was, I was actually working as a stand-in on, on a movie. Because I did extra work and stand-in work, uh, you know, in the beginning, uh, help uh, make ends meet and stuff. And, and uh, um, I was working with James Garner, um, standing in for John Lithgow. And Jay, oh I remember God. seeing James Garner. He was laughing and joking. Their roll cameras, and they sell, you know, called action, and boom, he was his character. It was like he just it, it flicked a switch, and and he played this great character. And uh, he, but he was just. I was so relaxed and obviously been doing it for so long. And, and uh, uh, that, that's, you know, just an example of, of what a great actor can do. Yeah, no, that's Which, so cool. I'm not, I'm not a great actor by, by any stretch. <laughs> uh, you never stop learning. But, uh, but you know, when I've had a chance to see some really great actors uh, work. And uh, it, uh, it, it's really something to see. Yeah, no, that's so cool. It's uh, because there's, a, the, there's so many methods for acting. One is that the James Gardner joking around action change. Yeah. And there's the people like yeah. Jim Carrey and uh, when he did man on the moon and he was in character 24 seven when he was playing Tony Clifton in that movie, which is insane. Well, Jim, do you have any, he's one of my, yeah. 
he's one of my favorite actors. I mean, yeah. I, 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 I just, he's so talented. And, uh, um, you know, it, it's, it, it, I love watching his movies because he, he, who could do what he does? Yeah. I mean, I, before him or since him, uh, uh, he's just really amazing to watch. Yeah, and I think it's crazy, like, when you were working on Ace Ventura 2, like, two years before that, like, two years probably to when you were filming that, yeah. people were like, oh, that's that white guy from A Living Color. But that right. one year, man, he had Dumb and Dumber, Ace Ventura, The Mask, Batman Forever, and then Ace Ventura 2. I interviewed a few people that were in the tribe from that movie, The Chief and his translator, and they had, like, really great stories. Talk about this guy that, like, so much – was like his life changed overnight really like within two yeah. years so <laughs> i just remember i had a flashback um so uh, you remember the rhinoceros scene yeah where Jim Carrey comes out of the so i i'm i go to i'm going to the special effects shop mike mazina was the he's a stunt guy but he also does special effects and he was sort of uh, john thomas's uh, john thomas was his sort of mentor coming up and everything and i so I remember going to the shop when they were building that rhinoceros and seeing seeing it and everything. And just thinking, you know, I'd read the scene and stuff, and, and uh, you know, I could just see how this is going to go. And uh, anyway, that's pretty famous. Pretty oh. famous. Scene. Just the way the little tiny fan goes out and he keeps tapping it, and then it just finally dies. And just how long he took to get out of that. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> so great. <laughs> so Ken, do you do you have any favorite acting roles that you did over the years? Is there one that like stood out for you personally? Uh, you know, uh, the, the, doing the western, the because uh, I love westerns. Um, doing doing the Gunsmoke western was really special because I'd grown up watching James Arness and yeah. uh, and getting to meet Tony Epper, uh, being on location. Um, you know, getting to play cowboy, you know, like I say, when I was a kid, I was always, I always wanted, you know, six guns and stuff like that for Christmas. I remember I had this one Winchester rifle that shot uh, little plastic bullets and I was like picking off the three wise men and stuff like that. But I mean, so I growing up playing these games and stuff like that and to be there, to be on a horse, uh, you know, to to have a a gun strapped to my hip all day and, and playing cowboy um that i you know that was really memorable um uh, for me i think uh and because tony Epper uh had done a lot of great westerns uh, and um i could sit there and listen to him all night uh you know tell stories and stuff like that so that was a, and young in my career too so uh uh you, you know you, you're impressionable and and it was just a great experience all around and, you know i remember they hardly do this anymore, but at the end of the movie, the producers send out a letter and thank you for, you know, the work you did and stuff. And they mentioned my fast draw. So I was pretty happy about that. And, and uh, so that, that, you know, that one, that one sticks out for sure. Yeah. Do you, do you, did you ever keep anything from set like scripts or things from like uh, stunt scenes or anything? You know, I actually stole a, a 45 dummy bullet from Gunsmoke and uh nice. and i've you know i've you know probably pilfered a few little souvenirs over the years that yeah. i do have like a memory trunk um, nice and uh so yeah you know i over the years I, especially early in my career because it was all so new and fun oh yeah i just you know it was such hard work long hours but when you're young you know you you don't notice it as much and you, yeah. you've got so much energy and you're doing this thing you love, and so the, uh, you know, it just doesn't seem like, doesn't seem like work, uh, yeah. even though you're doing 16 hour days for, you know, six days a week, getting living on four hours sleep, and you know, um, we did uh, 13th Warrior. I remember I was one of the stunt coordinators on that, and, and it was a huge budget movie, um, big sequences, and. Uh, I remember telling the stunt guys, you know, this will be one year you'll be glad you did when you did once it's done because it was hard work, but uh, it was, it, that was a great experience too. So what would you say, how has the industry changed? Like from you say late eighties, like when you're already in the groove, like working on like bigger budget projects, like, and then towards like the, like the two thousands, like what was like the, the difference? Was it like CGI 
and not relying too much on the stunt end of it? No, I mean, there's more stunt people than ever right now, but uh, um, definitely uh, CGI started to change the industry, you know, came along and really uh, changed the way things were done and made it better. I mean, there's just things you can't do to the human body. Yeah. Uh, you know, Ryan Reynolds getting hit by two cars in, in uh, <laughs> uh, uh, Free Guy, you know, um, yeah. which they stole from an earlier movie that Brad Pitt did. Um Anyway, it, you know, there's just you can't do that with a with a human being and, and make it look as good. Um, so thankfully, they you know because you got all these you know superhero movies now that people have to do. I can't imagine how many stunt people you would go through making a movie. You know how many broken yeah. stunt guys there would be if it wasn't for CGI. <laughs> and there's still enough stunt work out there, you know, to keep uh, stunt you know stunt people busy. And another big change is that uh, stunt people. Are, tend to specialize more now. So you've got, you know, people that are uh, specializing in fight scenes or oh, okay, yeah. uh, gymnastics and fight scenes. And, and uh, then you've got some people that specialize in doing fire gags or, or stunt driving, and, and uh, uh, which makes sense, right? I mean, if you're yeah. going to get better, you, you focus on one thing and you become <laughs> really, really, really good at it. And whereas, you know, back in my day, it was, it was, uh, you did it, you know, tried to do as much as you could of everything so, so that you work more. Uh, but that's not the way to make, you know, the best fire gag or, You're the right, best yeah. or, uh, when you, when you specialize in something, you become really, really good at it. <laughs> Is there like a stunt school or have you mentored any stunt people like over the years or? There's been stunt schools in Vancouver off and on over the years. They usually don't last long because uh, they're usually put on by people who can't make it as stunt people. So they yeah. open a stunt school and, <laughs> and there, there's been some stunt schools uh, in, in LA that uh, Kahana's was a famous one, I think. And uh, um, the, you know, there's been stunt driving schools. Uh, there's one that's run out of Vancouver now, which is, which is great because uh, the way I kind of learned, the way I learned to stunt drive, this is my, my first stunt driving lesson. And uh, I don't know if any of this can come back. I mean, I think, I think the, uh, the statute of limitations yeah. is up <laughs> long ago. But, so I'm working on, uh, I'm doing a movie with James Garner and, uh, and uh, Louis Delgado is James Garner's oldest friend. They went to high school together and Louis was, uh, had a small, was James Garner's stand in. And I was standing in for John Lithgow. And uh, if John, there was a there was a, a possibility of me getting to double John Lithgow doing a stunt. Um, anyway, I wanted to learn. I was talking to Louis about being a stunt man, and he goes, "Yeah, well, I got to learn to stunt, stunt drive uh, when James Garner l learned to stunt drive." Um, you know, they hung out together and stuff like that. So you know, the the famous Garner, you know, uh, reverse one eighty that he did. A lot of the movies, you know, uh, Louie learned that too. And uh, when James Garner learned to uh, drive race cars for a big race car movie he did, Louie got to do that too. And and Louie said, well, if you ever get a car in a place, you know, let me know and I'll, I'll, I'll show you. I'll show, show you a few tricks. So me being the young, stupid guy that I was who wouldn't let anything stand in the way of me becoming a stuntman, thought, this is great. I, you know, okay. So <clears throat> we're shooting in Victoria, where I grew up. Small town. Uh, I go out to the airport, and I go to the airport manager, and I go, hey, uh, I'm the stunt coordinator on this uh, movie we're shooting, and I want to rehearse the stunt. Could we use the end of one of your runways? And he says, yes. <laughs> didn't <laughs> check my credentials. Didn't, didn't ask any qu other questions. Yeah, sure. I mean, people knew that there was a movie being shot. I mean, if I... It, I just can't imagine the hell that would have broken loose. So, so then I go to budget rent. I can't remember if it was budget or, or which rental care company it was. Budget sticks out in my mind, and I and I rent a car, and I call Louie up, and I go Sunday morning. We're going out stunt driving, and uh, and he goes, "You got a place?" I go, "Yep." He goes, "You got a car?" I go, "Yep." And I pick Louie up, and we go up to the airport, and uh, we're, he shows me some car slides with this car and uh and uh, that was my first stunt driving lesson <laughs> again 
And I learned enough then that uh, I eventually bought my own uh, a police car off a Burt Reynolds movie uh, called Malone. And, and uh, oh yeah, yeah. And, and uh, so I, then I found locations in the city that were, you know, an old behind an old warehouse or something like that. And I would go practice behind that warehouse until the police came, and then I would t- take off and. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, the police would sometimes come right up to me and, and you know, and I'd say, oh, I'm a stunt guy. I'm, I'm just rehearsing, you know, and they, they never arrested me uh, for whatever reason. And um, I ended up getting my first stunt driving job on a TV series. What was it called? It was, it was based on, uh, there had been a feature film that had done really well and they made it into a TV series and, not Cobra, yeah. right? No, it wasn't Cobra. Okay. It was, uh, Gene Wilder was in the uh, was in the original movie, but anyway, so my fun, first stunt driving job is on Robson and Granville in Vancouver, which is one of the busiest downtown streets. And um, uh, I'm in a cop car, and they, I've got pedestrians on on the corners. They, they weren't backing people up and stuff like that. So if I spun out or lost it or something like that, I'm into all these people and whatnot. And um, luckily I was pretty confident about my driving by then. And so I, I you know, slid the car uh, three or four times around the corner. It all went great. And after that, I kind of developed a reputation in Vancouver as a, as, as a good stunt driver and ended up getting a lot of work as a stunt driver over the years. Jesus, that. is that the nerve? Is that like the most? Obviously, like you said, you have to be calm when you do a stunt. Is something like that the most nerve wracking? Because obviously, you're in control, but there's like yeah. this vehicle that you're in that can cause damage. Well, if you know, a tire can blow out. You know, you, you check all that ahead of time. Yeah, yeah. You know, the, the tires look good and all that kind of stuff. But I would say, you know, being new, my first car sliding job. On, yeah. You know, uh, being, in that situation uh i i was focused put it that way um <laughs> you, you focus on what you have to do and put the nerves aside and and uh, you know go out and do and if you've done it enough times it sort of becomes muscle memory and and uh and part of that so you know like athletes go into the zone you know yeah. a, a stunt person or an actor you know or, or anybody that's done something enough times goes into the zone yeah. and you've programmed yourself to do this and, and um and so the, it, you know, it's like starting a game. You're nervous before the game, and then you do it a couple times, and now the nerves are gone, and you're just focused on what you're doing. I still can't believe the guy at the airport. All you had to do is say something, and he was like, "All right." Yeah, he, yeah. You know what? I, I was just so naive and dumb. I mean, I could have ruined my whole career, uh, you know, because if, if that had gotten out, and, and this idiot went to the airport and told him he was the stunt coordinator. He was yeah. a, a stand-in on the on the movie. But I was just uh, <clears throat> determined to make it as a stunt guy. And, and uh, you know, uh, <laughs> I think I'd seen, out. I, I'd seen Hooper uh, <laughs> yeah. too many times. <laughs> You're like, I could do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, man, that's amazing. I always like to ask this question. Obviously you went to school for like phys ed and like teacher and you said, Hey, I would have ended up being a, a cop or a fireman. Is that what you think you would have done if stunt? Obviously you're determined to be a stunt man, but if that didn't work out, you think you would have been a cop or a fireman? Uh, I think if there hadn't been a film industry here, uh, yeah, that would, would have, would have been a good likelihood, uh, getting into uh, being a cop or, or a fireman. I, I, you know, I always, I liked adventure and, and yeah. danger and, and uh, <laughs> you know, so I think well, probably one of those two things. Just the timing of everything worked, obviously like your passion yeah. for wanting to get in this. And it's just like everything blew up like at the right age for you in Vancouver. Yeah. Yeah. It's well, I mean, you know, it, the film industry is, is, is skill and then luck. I mean, uh, there, how many, awesome actors haven't been discovered because they didn't get the same breaks that yeah. Al Pacino did or, yeah. uh, or, or Ryan Reynolds or, or, you know, the, you know, you can't only just have the skill. You have to have the luck of, of, of meeting the right people, being in the right place at the right time. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of luck involved. 
and then you have to nail it. Like there's that luck of getting that one big job, but yeah. then you have to nail it because there's so many actors that I'm sure or any any part of the film industry, they got that one break and they bombed or didn't do the right thing and then they were like never heard of again. I, I've seen actors have to be replaced because oh. when they got on set they were too nervous. Oh. And they probably had a great audition and then they came to set and they're face to face with some actor that they, you know, been watching since they were a kid or whatever and they're just too nervous and, and they, they had to be replaced. Um <laughs> you know nerves are a big part of it it's this is your moment you know your chance to shine kind of thing and uh, people either do or they or, or they don't <laughs> yeah yeah ken this has been great one i i wanted to mention this little story because i think it it i think sometimes people don't think that other people have that same like feeling like you said when you were a kid and playing with your buddies and then years later you're doing that so yeah. like William Sadler I interviewed and he was telling me about when he was a kid, him and his buddy was would play like World War Two, like fake shooting guns. And you gotta think, he plays like these badass villains early on in his career, like Hard to Kill and Die Hard Two, all within a year of each other. He said when he yeah. was doing Die Hard Two when they're shooting up all the when they're shooting up McLean in the plane, he right. said he had to get stopped by the production I think it was the production manager or the director, and they came up and said, you don't need to make the gun sounds. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know what? That, I, I have a funny story about that, too. Yeah, go. That, that guy, they're rehearsing the shot where he comes into this room, and, and they go, okay, you're going to shoot the gun three times. So you, 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 you run in, and you go, bang, bang, bang. And, uh, you know, some people can react and, and stuff like that, and so they, he they roll cameras and he comes running into the room and he goes bang bang bang, <laughs> and so it's not the first time that's happened. That's great. <laughs> oh man, Ken, thanks for spending the time and I'm happy we finally connected. This will be on the next few months and uh, I'll send you a link if you want to check it out. But uh, yeah, yeah. It's so cool. Hey, thanks hey, for letting me pick I your plug, brain. Can I, a, can I plug a fan of mine? Oh uh, yeah, uh, Shana Keebler is a diehard fan of mine and she's written a book called uh, uh, rusty blade for the love of a fan. And it's out on Amazon now. Sweet. And, and uh, anyway, I just wanted to plug that book. Uh, if anybody wants to have a look at it, uh, you know, she, she's one of these people who I think was a little lost for a while and then just found her calling and writing. And I, and you know, all I did was say, keep writing and, She's written that book. She's working on another book, and I'm just really proud of her and, and uh, wanted to plug it. Cool. What I'll do is I'll just, if you want to send me the link to it, I'm sure I can find it. But if you just want to email the link, and then I'll put it in the episode notes and on my website, and I'll, I'll mention it in the intro so people can check it out. Okay, cool. That's I'll cool, that. man. Yeah. All right, right Ken. Now, really nice talking to you, Doug. Oh, dude, this has been great. Thank you so much. Yeah. My pleasure. See yeah, you later, Max. Yeah. Max is probably right yeah. there hanging out. All right, man. On the floor. <laughs> Have a good one. All right.